You are listening to a Clark's World Magazine podcast with your host and narrator, Kate Baker. Greetings, Clark's World citizens. Welcome to the second story of the month of May 2023, issue 200. We'd love some feedback from you. What makes coming back to Clark's World each and every time special for you or meaningful? Please let us know. You can go to clarksworldmagazine.com, and that is Clark with an E. You can send us an email via our contact information that's listed there. But why do you come back? Is it the stories? Is it the narration? Is it both? Is it the art, the nonfiction? Why do you come back and support us? Please let us know. And thanks again for supporting us. Whether this is your first story you're coming by and listening to, or somewhere over 800 at this point, you guys are what makes us keep going each and every month. And if you haven't supported us yet, please consider doing so. You can do so by going over to patreon.com forward slash Clark's World. Our second story is titled Through the Roof of the World and is by Harry Turtledove. Now, Harry Turtledove is an escaped Byzantine historian who writes alternate history, other science fiction, fantasy, much of it historically based, and, when he can get away with it, historical fiction. His most recent published book is Three Miles Down, Alien Contact in the 1970s. His next one will be The Wages of Sin, an alternate history with HIV getting loose in the world at the start of the 16th century. Turtle Dove lives in Los Angeles with his wife, writer and Broadway maven Laura Frankos. They have three daughters, two granddaughters, and three overprivileged cats. And if you like what you hear, you can go back to the Yorkshire Mammoth. So, my dear listener, I hope you can sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story. Scog hung in place, close enough to the roof of the world, so she could faintly hear her pulses echoing back from its jagged hardness. Coming back from everything in the area, those pulses told her of almost everything around her, out to pass the distance where it could be dangerous. Almost everything. Sneakers had skins that soaked up pulses and didn't let them return to the corn who'd sent them forth. If you weren't careful, you'd think a sneaker was a harmless little worm or jelly. Its pulses sounded small and wary, too. They did till it got close enough to jet at you and seize you with its beak. Anyway. No sneakers, Skog had learned to take due care, as any corn with a shell that had more than four or five chambers did. A small swimmer scooted along. Skog's pulses showed her the animal's shape. She could also hear its tail flipping back and forth and pushing it through space. Most of the time, swimmers were faster than jetters, but a jetter could squirt forward in a burst quicker than any swimmer could match. Am I close enough? Skog asked herself. She decided she was. Along with considered judgment, hunger had something to do with what she chose. She gathered herself, then loosed a jet that shot her toward the swimmer. It heard that, of course, and let out a shrill alarm cry as its tail flipped faster to take it away from peril. Too late. Too slow. A pair of Skog's tentacles lay hold of the swimmer and brought it back to her beak. She bit down. Swimmers were delicious. Though she knew the stink of sudden death, this one let out as she began to eat would frighten off other nearby food creatures till it dissipated in the limitless vastness of space. The swimmer made a three-bite snack, not a meal. After Skog finished, she jetted away from where she'd made her kill. The death stink unsettled her too. Though she understood perfectly well, she'd caused it. Corn were far more clever than other creatures that lived near the roof of the world but some things operated at a level far below the one where cleverness mattered. Something about her own size lay near the edge of her perception as she slowed once more. No, not something. Someone. That shell had the same shape as her own. Along with her unusual location pulses, she sent out some only her clan used. They amounted to, Who are you? Are you one of us? An answer came back at once, easily recognizable, through the background babble of animal noise. Is that you, Skog? Oh, 
Hello, Lund. You were so far off I couldn't hear your shape, but I could always recognize your voice. What are you up to? Skog said. I was trying to catch up to a school of nutworms. I smelled them off in the distance, but then a cold current got in my way and I lost the scent. Annoying. Lund let out a disgusted odor. Yeah, I hate when things like that happen, Skog said sympathetically. Corn had trained and bred nutworms to form themselves into a food-catching net when they got the proper sound and scent commands. That helped her folk hunt. The scraps of nutworms siphoned out of space meant they didn't lose in the deal either. A stinking nuisance, Lund agreed, swimming closer. He went on. I was talking with Ib not long ago. Do you know what she got her tentacles on? Tell me, Skog urged. Corn were no more immune to gossip than any other intelligent race anywhere in the universe. Ib has, Lund paused portentously. A stone point up from the bottom. Are you sure she wasn't making that up just to impress you? I heard the point with my own ears. I didn't just hear it either. She let me touch it. It was stone. I touched stone once before a long time ago. I know what it feels like. Nothing else is rough and sharp that way. I've heard of the stuff. Who hasn't? But I've never laid a tentacle tip on it myself. Jealous of you. I'm even more jealous of Ib, Skog said. All the way up from the bottom? Space had four or five zones, depending on where you were and on whom you chose to believe. Folk like Skog and Lund, who swam near the roof of the world, could descend only so far before the growing weight of space pressing down on them crushed in their shells and killed them. Conversely, the talkers in the next deeper zone, odd creatures, with long shells rather than round ones, would explode from the inside out if they rose too high. So it went, layer by layer, zone by zone, down to the bottom. Talkers lived there, too. Skog knew that, though she had no idea what they were like. Reports of them came up through, no one knew how many intermediaries, and they all disagreed with one another. Maybe more than one kind of talker dwelt there. Who could say? More than reports came up. Warm currents of space rose from the bottom. Currents full of things tiny creatures ate. Bigger creatures fed on the tiny ones, and creatures bigger still. And finally creatures big enough for corn to eat. And the bottom dwellers, however many sorts there were, had access to stone and other marvels. Those who lived in upper space could only imagine and envy. Skog wondered what the folk in the next higher zone traded to get things like that. What else could be worth so much? Lund went on. And since the stone isn't mine, I have to use what I can. I'm going after those networms again. With a little luck, just a little... I'll catch a trace of their scent and swim them down. Hope I hear and smell you soon, Skog. He turned and started to leave. Before he could, for that matter, before Skog could even answer him, they both stopped, freezing in place as if they'd suddenly become parts of the frigid roof of the world. That was what a noise unlike anything Skog had ever heard before could do. She realized... She hadn't thought of the roof of the world by accident. The strange noise sounded as if it were coming from beyond it, which had to be impossible, didn't it? The noise was harsh, grinding, rasping. It was so discordant, it made Skog wish she had no ears. She'd never wished for anything like that before. Once in a great while, a corn was hatched deaf or lost hearing through some injury or illness. Such luckless ones never lasted long. Scent and touch simply weren't enough to live in space. As the noise went on and on, Skog exclaimed, What is that? She answered her own question, though not in any useful way. Whatever it is, it's, it's horrible. The corn who made the roof space in the bottom truly has a radula like ours. It might sound like gnawing through a shell, Lund said. Of themselves, Skog's tentacles twisted in the sign of respect Korn used when they spoke of their leading deity. She could hear Lund doing the same thing. After a moment, she said, It sounds like it's gnawing through the roof of the world towards us. Why would the great Korn do that? Gods do what they do for their reasons, not for ours, 
Lund answered, which was bound to be true but wasn't helpful. I thought the stuff of the roof of the world went on forever, the way the bottom is supposed to. I never imagined a god could get purchase on the other side and start boring through. I never imagined there was another side, Skog said. Neither did I. Maybe those stories the rememberers tell are true after all. Maybe the roof of the world does split open now and then, so space goes all the way up to the top till it gets hard again. I, I've heard rememberers sing that too. I never met any corn who heard it with their own ears or smelled it with their own olfactory pores. Till I do, I'm not going to believe it, Skog said stubbornly. Or till the great corn's radula gnaws through and pokes down into space where we can hear it ourselves. Lynn's voice was sly. We can hear it now. Oh, I wish we couldn't. Makes my brain hurt. Mine too. Everybody's, I'm sure. Everything's, Lynn said. Everything with ears is probably swimming away from this stench of space as fast as it can. We should do that. Skog joined action to the word. Lynn swam with her. The grinding, rasping noise pursued them like a bad smell. Before long, they heard another corn who were doing their best to get away from the alarming sound coming out of the roof of the world. One of them was Ip. Skog could hear the marvelous stone point in spite of the tentacle the other corn protectively wrapped around it. She wanted to ask if she might touch it too. Before she could, though, Ib said, What if we do... If that gnawing thing bites all the way through the roof of the world and comes down into our space? That question made Skog's swimming fin miss a stroke. Lund had said the same thing. Skog didn't want to believe anything so horrible could happen. Why would the corn who made the roof, space, and the bottom want to do that? She asked in return. How do you know it is the great corn? Ip said. Maybe it's a monster swimming in the space beyond the roof of the world. Till now, nobody ever imagined there was any space beyond it. I always thought it went on forever. Doesn't everybody? Skog said. Well, we corn mostly do, Nib allowed. But the long shell I got my knife from, that's what he called it, a knife, said they think there's another world like ours on the far side of the roof. She shifted her tentacle a little so Skog could hear the sharp stone better. Skog let out a scornful little jet of space through her siphon. What do longshells know about the roof? Only what we tell them. They can't come all the way up to it. They'd die if they tried. Besides, are you ever sure you knew what the creature was saying? Well, I thought so. But Ib sounded suddenly doubtful. Talkers of different sorts could communicate with one another when they met. Otherwise, there would have been only struggle between them, not trade but one kind couldn't understand another as well as it could with its fellows. Then Ib spoke with more determination. If the thing tries to break into our space, we should fight it. How? Skog thought that was a reasonable question. Ib, though, dismissed it with a wave of a tentacle that wasn't holding anything. We don't know what it's like yet. When we find out, we can hear what to do next. Or have you got a better idea? Oh, and he put it like that. No, Skog admitted. Ib changed her hearing pulse ever so slightly into a sardonic rhythm that could only mean, I told you so. Time went on. The rasping, grinding sound went on, too. And on, and on, and on. It never ceased. In fact, it kept getting louder, as if the toothed tongue, Skog couldn't help thinking, the thing that made the noise as a radula but she had no idea if it really was. It's coming closer. Because it was so unpleasant, the corn who usually hunted in that part of space had to go to or even beyond the edge of what they and the neighboring clans thought of as their territory. That caused less trouble than Skog expected. The sound was so loud and so unpleasant, it brought corn from far away to try to learn what it was and how it might be stopped. Until it comes through the roof of the world, if it ever does, I don't know what we can do about it, Skog told one stranger after another. Ib was right about that, however little Skog liked it. But it's driving us mad, was what she most often heard back. 
It was also driving her mad. She wondered if the great corn was saying she and her folk needed to go crazy before they could find out the answer to the infuriating abrasion. A corn who'd come up from near the boundary to the next lower level told her, It's loud enough to frighten the long shells too. In fact, one of them said to me, I'm pretty sure that's what she said, the talking worms down below them are scared. Maybe it goes even deeper than that. All the corn knew of the talking worms was what they had heard from the long shells. By the nature of things, none of them had ever heard or smelled or tried to speak with a talking worm themselves. The two kinds could, would, never meet. The folk who swam or jetted below the talking worms were rumors, multiply distorted. But there was stone on the bottom. Ib had that point made from it. And other corn who wrapped their tentacles around tools made from the marvelous stuff brought it toward the fearsome sound from above. They all seemed to realize only the extraordinary had even the smallest chance of defeating whatever made it. Networm wranglers like Lund and other males and females who could control venomous swimmers also came to do what they could. It made Skog proud. We've never all joined together like this, she said. Not in all the time we have stories about. The talkers in the zones under ours are doing what they can too, or I think they are, Lund replied. Skog understood what he meant. Nobody, nobody who was a corn, anyhow, could be sure about any of the races that dwelt in the depths of space. I wonder if they wish they could be the ones facing the rasping thing, or if they're glad we've got to do it. It will depend, I think. If we can make the giant Radula quiet down or go away, they'll all think they could have done it easier or faster, Lynn said. But if we can't, they'll blame us and hope it doesn't sink so deep enough that they'll have to try and fight it. You make more sense than I wish you did. That sounds like something they would do. Skog paused for a moment. That sounds like something we'd do too, if we'd had the chance. It does, doesn't it? Lund sounded unhappy about agreeing, but agree he did. He pointed several of his tentacles up toward the part of the roof of the world where the noise was coming from. I just wish it would stop. It doesn't feel like it's outside of me anymore. It feels like it's rasping its way right through my brain. Oh, good, Skog exclaimed. Lund made a quizzical change in his sound pulse pattern. She amplified. I'm not the only one, then. By now, I think everybody who can hear it feels that way. It goes on and on and never stops. It never sleeps. Everything has to rest some of the time, everything that's alive. Or I thought it did, till that started up. Does the great corn, the corn who made the roof space in the bottom, have to rest? Skog asked. Lund turned toward her as she were holding a piece of delicious-smelling bait in one tentacle, just waiting for an unwary worm to come by and grab it so she could gobble up a meal. I'm not going to snap at that, he said. First, you have to tell me whether the great corn is alive the way you and I are. I always thought that the god went on forever. That's what makes a god a god, that and being strong, Skog hesitated. Till the noise started, I never imagined the great corn would want to bore through the roof and start sucking out the world's juices. You have a way with words, don't you? By Lund's tone, it wasn't a way he much cared for. I'm sorry. I don't like what's going on any better than you do, or than anybody else does. But why else would that grinding keep on the way it does? I don't know. Now that you said that, though, I can't unhear it or forget it. Maybe I should try spinning tails, then? Skog thought. If the thing gnawing through the roof of the world doesn't kill us all, I'll have a good one to spin, and if it did... She waggled her tentacles in a way that meant, in that case, I won't need to worry about it, will I? Skog woke suddenly, throwing her tentacles out every which way at once, as she might have if a loud noise close by startled her from sleep. But no reverberations from any loud noise lingered in space. None reflected from anyone or anything close by or from the more distant roof of the world. In fact, everything out as far as she could hear was pretty quiet. For a moment, she simply accepted that, then she gave another wild, startled jerk of her tentacles. 
It wasn't what she'd heard that had jerked her from sleep like a spearfin's envenomed dart. It was what she didn't hear, what she'd gotten used to, got resigned to, hearing, but wasn't there anymore. The thing that had been boring down through the roof of the world was silent. Which meant, what? Had it stopped because it couldn't get through, because it wasn't strong enough or wasn't long enough to rasp all that way? However long that way happened to be? Or was it quiet now because it had broken through and didn't need to grind anymore? One answer said one thing, the other something altogether different. How to find out which was true. She tried the obvious way. She sent pulses up toward the roof of the world, but she was a good distance away from it, and she wasn't right under the spot where the gigantic radula had been rasping. And between here and that stretch of the roof were a good many corn swimming and even jetting, and obscuring the shapes that lay beyond them. They were, she realized, swimming and jetting toward the place from which her grinding noise had been coming. That didn't directly answer her question, but it gave her a clue. She also started swimming in that direction and squirting space out through her siphon to go faster. There was Ib, also using her jet. Skog recognized her more by the stone point she held than by the shape of her shell. Is it through? she called. It's through, Ib answered. Didn't you hear it when it came down into the space? I was asleep, but woke me was not hearing the horrible noise. I can think straight again, or I hope I can. That would be good, Ib said. Skog almost sent an angry pulse of sound at the other corn, but at the last instant stifled it instead. They swam on. As they drew closer to the place where the radula had broken through the roof of the world, Skog aimed her pulses upward, trying to learn what it sounded like. She kept having trouble. For one thing, a great many corn filled the space between her and the interloper. There were so many of them, their shells and tentacles hid it from her. For another, they were all, or almost all, sending out pulses themselves. She had a hard time sorting the echoes coming back from hers out from the rest of them. We'll never get through that crowd, Ib complained. Oh yes, we will. Skog was not about to give up without satisfying her curiosity. She took direct and bumptious action. Bumptious indeed. She bumped a male out of the way when he wouldn't move aside on his own. What do you think you're doing? He asked irately. The way he spoke said he'd swum here from the same far-off part of space. Skog could hardly understand him. When she was sure she did, she answered, I think I'm getting by. I'm right, too. You hear, Ib? Just in back of you, her clan's mate said. They both left the indignant male behind. After a while, Ib took the lead. She didn't have to threaten anyone with the sharpened stone she carried. Just letting strangers hear she had it was plenty to make them scurry away, so she couldn't slash them with it. The ones who didn't scurry away also bore sharp stones, or other curious and probably dangerous things that had come up almost to the roof of the world from the bottom. And there was someone bringing along the biggest school of networm Skog had ever heard in one place. Yes, it was Lund. She felt proud of him. He was showing Korn from near and far what he could do. Before she could call out and say so, she managed to aim an unblocked pulse at the thing that had pierced the roof of the world. The sounds that came back from it left her more perplexed than she had been before she heard it clearly. It was long and skinny. That didn't surprise her, most radulas were. She also wasn't surprised to hear that space had already hardened up again around the place where the thing broke through. But the thing itself also sounded hard, as if it were made of shell or smooth stone, not the flesh she'd expected. As Skog came closer, she got off another unimpeded pulse. Something at the base of the improbably hard radula was moving in a horizontal circle. It might have been scanning the area around it, it might have been but it wasn't. Skog was sure it wasn't because... Ib said it before she could. Whatever that thing is, it's not letting out any sound, none at all. You beat me to it, Skog said. Why did it rasp all the way through the roof of the world and then not try to find out what space is like? It makes no sense. They can't be waiting for one of us to come close enough to be grabbed or tasted. The smell by itself can only tell you so much. 
Speaking of making sense, maybe it has senses we don't, Ib said. I can't imagine how it would, Skog said. Hearing, touch, smell, taste. What other senses could there possibly be? Balance? It was doing her best to be difficult. Skog made an exasperated noise. All right, fine. Balance. Tell me how a sense of balance helps that thing know what's around it, please. I can't, Ib said cheerfully, but I can tell that I'm not upside down or sideways, and I don't need to hear myself or feel myself to do it. With you, it wouldn't matter, Skog said tartly. Ib thought that was funny, which only annoyed Skog more. Anyway, what's important is how we can make that thing go back to where it came from, or if we can't do that, how we can hurt it enough so it doesn't do anything anymore. That is important, Ib agreed. How can we do either one of those things? I've got no idea, Skog said, in a small voice. The mail from far away, the one Skog and Ib had passed on their way toward the giant Rajula, was brave enough, even if he didn't swim very fast. He edged right up to the strange thing, sounded it at really close range, and felt of it with his tentacles. It rested quietly in space and didn't try to do anything to him. He couldn't have known that it wouldn't before he tried, though. Other corn, Skog, Ib, and Lind among them, let out toots of admiration as he made his getaway. He moved quite smartly then. It, it feels the way it sounds, he reported. Very smooth and hard, smoother and harder than anything I've ever felt before. Oh, I nibbled at it too. My beak couldn't do anything to it and it didn't taste like anything much. Beaks are tough. Stone is tougher, Ib said, and brandished hers. What is that thing at the bottom? The one that keeps going round and round? It's the only part of the radula that's doing anything, Skog said. Let's see how strong it is. Ib swam toward the tube that had come down to the roof of the world. She stabbed at it with the stone she carried in her tentacles. Whatever the thing was, it proved not just strong enough as stone, but stronger than stone. Skog heard the snap as Ib's knife broke. Ib was left holding the rear portion, the part the bottom dwellers hadn't chipped. So sharp. The business end tumbled through space, down, down, down. Cursing furiously, Ib jetted after it. She managed to grab it before anyone else could. Even tiny fragments of stone were valuable, all out of proportion to their size. She rose more slowly than she'd sunk. When she'd made her way back up to the neighborhood of the gigantic Radula, Ska greeted her with, Oh, that didn't work. Too right it didn't. Ib agreed in mournful tones. Oh, listen, Skog said. Lund is trying with his networms. Lund deployed the great school of networms he'd brought with his customary cunning. He used trills and scents to shape them into a cylinder that fit around the huge radula. It did nothing to try to invade them. Now that it was down here, it didn't seem to do anything but spin that tough thing at its tip. Why would it have rasped its way down to the roof of the world just to do that? Nothing about it made any sense to Skog or, clearly, to any of the other corn. At Lund's squeak, the cylinder closed in. The network's stinging palps tried to pierce the great Radula's hide. They had no more luck than that male from far away had had with his beak or Ib had with her now broken knife. Frustrated, the networms broke contact and swam away in spite of everything Lund could do to make them come back to him. He was frustrated, too, as he came over to Skog and Ib. I think the great corn sent that thing down through the roof of the world just to infuriate us, he said. And then, a moment later, it's working, too. It is! Ib bounced sound from each of her two pieces of stone in turn. The places where it had snapped now had their own sharp edges, not that they would do her much good. They seemed more likely to cut her. She made a small, sorrowful noise. Life had been more useful when it was whole. Without a stone tool of her own, without a school of networms to help her, Skog swam toward the enormous radula. She pulsed sound toward the turning thing at its base. The closer she got, the more accurately she could hear, and the more interesting the thing seemed along with a thick main tentacle connecting it to the rest of the radula. 
and had a couple of very thin strands on the opposite sides of the thick one. Skog reached out and touched one of the thin strands. When she pulled, it gave a little, but only a little. Even that small yielding encouraged her. Nothing else on the radula seemed to have given any at all. She pulled harder, jetting away from the radula to add force to her effort. Try as she would, though, she wasn't strong enough to pull the thin tentacle loose. It was as firmly connected to the radula as her own tentacles were to her head. That thought led to another one. When corn, corn without stone tools anyhow, fought, they used not only tentacles, but biting beaks. What would happen if, instead of pulling on that strand, she nipped it? Only one way to find out. Hooking the thin strand with the end of her beak, she bit down on it, gently at first, then harder. If her beak lacked the strength to injure that strand, someone else would have to figure out what to try next. For a moment, she thought she would fail, but then her beak cut through an outer layer and made contact with something harder inside. An instant later, she jetted away from the thing with all her strength. She also must have let out a cry of alarm, but she didn't realize she had till Ib exclaimed, What happened? Skog needed a few beats of her hearts to take stock of herself and decide she was probably all right. She needed a few more heartbeats to gather herself enough to answer. That stupid thing shocked me. It shocked me like a bugle clitz. I never expected it could do anything like that. When you heard them swimming along, bugle clitzen didn't seem like much. They were smaller than corn and unable to go very fast. But creatures in this part of space soon learned to keep their distance from them. A bugle clitz's shock could stun at some distance from the swimmer itself. At close range, it could kill small animals and leave even corn too addled to defend themselves when the bugle clitz slowly swam up and began to feed. Well, you did something to it, too, Ib said. That bottom part isn't going round and round anymore. Maybe you killed it. Maybe the shock skog. God had addled her. She hadn't thought to check if she'd hurt the thing that went around and around. When he did, she heard that Ib was right. She could smell her own satisfaction, too. Maybe I did, she said. By the great corn, I hope so. Professor Darius Heydari walked briskly to the lectern on one side of the stage at the Von Karman Auditorium. The big screen monitor behind him showed only black. From the surround sound speakers, though, came unearthly. Unearthly in the most literal sense of the word. Trills and squeals and screeches. The crowd filling the seats in the hall on the JPL campus was as motley as the noises bubbling out of the speakers. Astronomers and xenologists rub shoulders with reporters and bloggers and science fiction writers. For that matter, some of the scientists also wrote SF, while others had considerable social media footprints. They all had sported badges showing they were authorized to be there. Hidari wore one himself. He waited till most of the audience was looking at him, then he tapped the mic on the lectern to get the attention of the others. Good morning, he said with a tired smile. Like most of the Sarpedon team, he hadn't been sleeping much lately. The last day and a half have been quite something, haven't they? Why would you think that? Somebody called from the crowd and got a laugh. Professor Heydari smiled again, more broadly this time. He managed a couple of syllables worth of chuckle. When Sarpedon landed on Europa and began to drill through the surface ice toward the ocean below... We had no idea what we would find in the water there. We had no idea whether we'd find anything at all. Anything organic, I mean. Well, we did, a woman exclaimed. People were too excited to keep quiet, even if most of them were running on coffee and fumes just like him. Yes, we did, Hidari nodded. We found the answers to a question we've been asking for thousands of years. We aren't alone in the universe, either as life or as intelligent life. We'll spend the rest of our time on Earth and wherever else we go working out just what that means. He touched controls on top of the lectern. The big screen behind him lit up. In the upper right-hand corner were the words, Recorded Previously, and a digital time signature from three days earlier. 
Something came into the beam of light. Sarpedon's video system shot out into the waters beneath Europa's icy surface. It looked more like a chambered nautilus than any other earthly creatures. It had a spiral shell, tentacles, and a beak. But one way it differed from a nautilus was immediately obvious. It had no eyes at all. Europa's icy crust ranges in thickness from about 15 to 25 kilometers, and... Heydari began. Before he could go any further, someone, almost certainly a reporter, asked, What's that in miles? The professor would have been more irked had he been more surprised, but he'd expected the question and answered with no sign of annoyance. 9 to 15. Thanks to ground-piercing radar, Sarpedon landed where it was thinnest. Even so, light can't penetrate that far, except for major meteor strikes and occasional ruptures in the icy crust. Ours is the first light to have shown in that ocean for billions of years. The creatures there haven't evolved organs to sense it. By what we hear, whatever they use for ears must be very sensitive. The sounds the probe is picking up range from our subsonic to ultrasonic. He touched the controls again. A different nonaloid, Europan, appeared. When it got just where he wanted it, he froze it on the screen. As if he were a football commentator, he drew an arrow pointing to what it held in its tentacles. This is unmistakably a stone tool. There can be no doubt that we're dealing with another intelligent species here. And the tool is remarkable for a couple of reasons. Hidari held up one finger. As far as we can tell, Europa's outer crust is almost entirely ice. That's what lets it float on the ocean below. I'm not saying there are no rocks in the ice, but they be rare. We spotted several Europans with shaped stones. They don't come from the crust. Where do they come from? The sea bottom, someone suggested. The professor nodded and held up another finger. It seems likely, but Europa's ocean is anywhere from 60 to 150 kilometers. Okay, 40 to 100 miles deep. It gets 20 times as deep as the Mariana Trench, in other words. The pressure down there would be over 22,500 kilograms per square centimeter. Before you ask, that's about 320,000 pounds per square inch. All the same, there's presumably commerce between whatever creatures live on the bottom and the nautiloids we're seeing up near the top of the ocean. Before anyone could ask him why he didn't think the nautiloids also lived near the bottom, he went on to explain. I have trouble imagining how creatures evolved to fit conditions near the crust would be able to withstand the enormous water pressure so much farther down. The ecology of the European Ocean must be fascinating. Then a woman asked a question he'd been expecting and dreading at the same time. Why wasn't the cable powering the affected devices positioned inside the main tube so one of those creatures couldn't bite through it? Well, for one thing, we didn't really have room to put it in there, Hedari answered. For another, we didn't really expect Europans either. We'd hope we'd find life. That seemed reasonable. The conditions down there are right, but this... He shook his head. Believe me, I'm as gobsmacked as you are. What do we do now? Three people said the same thing at the same time. Well, it was the next obvious question. Well, we keep recording the sounds the Europans are making, recording and analyzing them. We keep doing that unless they break the other external cable, anyhow. If they do... Hedari shrugged. Well, when do we send a new probe? That one also got chorused. All he could do was shrug again and spread his hands. I hope we go back. But it wouldn't be right away if we do. We have to get an appropriation to build the probe. With the video and audio we have, I think we can do that. I hope we can. Then we've got to design it and fabricate it. We have to wait for the right time to launch it. And we have to wait years while it travels from Earth to Europa. Then... Then we see what happens. I'll be middle-aged by then, he thought. He wondered whether any of the Europans who had attacked Sarpedon's camera would still be alive when the new probe drilled through the ice toward their ocean home. 
If they were, he suspected they wouldn't have to jump through so many hoops to meet it as he and his fellow scientists would in creating it. For their sake, he hoped not. What are your thoughts on the story? Please go to the Clark's World Magazine website, and that is Clark with an E. And there you'll find our contact information if, if you'd like to leave us some feedback. Thanks again for spending this time with me and Harry Turtle Dove. We have a bunch of stories left for you for the month of May. I do hope you can come back and listen, should you so choose. And until then, my dear listener, I bid you a very fond and hopefully very temporary farewell. 